Good evening and welcome to the Monday, June 12th meeting of the Green Bay Plan Commission. Start with a roll call. Chair Lisa Hansen, present. Vice Chair Jacob Miller, present. Uh, Alder, <laughs> Alder Jim Hutchinson, present. Commissioner Sidney Bremer, present. Commissioner Darius Daniels, present. Commissioner Ken Ravinsky, present. And Commissioner Michael Paradic, present. We add to the approval of the agenda. Approval of the agenda for the June 12th, 2023 meeting of the Green Bay Plan Commission. And we will um, we will be moving items four and five up to item number one. Uh, so I'll move with those changes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then moving on to the approval of the minutes. Approval of the minutes from the May 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Green Bay Plan Commission. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then moving on to regular business, um, starting with item number four, which is a public hearing. This public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the press times. The plan commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject agenda items. We invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, whether you favor, oppose, or are only providing information in this matter, and your comments or concerns. We also ask that you confine your testimony to facts related to the proposal at hand and avoid repetitive testimony. City staff will provide a presentation during the public hearing and questions raised by the public may be asked, but they will not be answered by staff until the upcoming actionable item. You must be recognized by the plan commission in order to speak and please address your comments to the chair. Comments will be limited to three minutes. And we'll now open the public hearing on item number four, public hearing on a request for a conditional use permit at 644 South Quincy Street for personal service office use in the low density residential district submitted by Family Services of Northeastern Wisconsin on behalf of Ethan House Inc. property owner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I have one comment that I'll read in as well that came by email. Okay. I'll give you just a quick overview. Um, so this uh, this property is on the corner of Cass and Quincy Streets in the northwest corner. Um, it, is, it is a single family home. Uh, historically, it has been used as a group home called the Ethan House. Here's some images of the front and sides. Um, the home itself is um, um, about a 3,000 square foot frame house. It was constructed in 1892. It has a two stall garage and a two parking stall uh, driveway. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980, the State Register of Historic Places in 1989, and is a contributing uh, property to our uh, locally designated um, Aster uh, Historic District. So to kind of give you some background, it had historically been used as a group home. Um, uh, family Services of Northeast Wisconsin who owned the property um, want to turn it into a self house or cell stands for support, education, life skills, and family. This is a program for mentoring, providing life skills and support to families and children, um, both off-site and within the proposed facility itself. Um, they are proposing hours between eight and six um, on weekdays with unspecified limited hours on the weekends. Um, they will always be staffed by a family services personnel. Parking for the use would include the four stalls I talked about and three uh, parking stalls that are passed at parking passes on the street. Um, again, it has to follow through with the uh, conditions of the conditional use permit and also some of the design regulations for allowing um, an office use in a single family residential district. Um, Alder Person Galvin, the Astor Neighbors Association, and adjacent property owners within 200 feet of the subject area were notified of the request. Um, at this time, I had only received one written that asked me to please put it into the record. So it is good morning. I received a letter for conditional use permit at 644 South Quincy Street for personal service office use for family services. 
on behalf of Ethan House. My husband and I are unable to attend the meeting tonight, but wanted to voice our objection to the using the house as an office. We live in a beautiful historic neighborhood that people are always looking to live in. I understand this was a group home years, four years, which was a wonderful way to provide the housing needs. It is a wonderful community and using that space as office space eliminates the opportunity for people to live here and enjoy the benefits of the wonderful neighborhood. There's a lot of office space in the downtown area that could be better, that could better be used. We also have concerns that would create possible parking issues. The residents that own the homes around the property have guests who at times need to park on the street. Needing business parking takes parking away from them. Currently, we have noticed a lot more cars parked in front of the house on both sides of the street, which makes it very difficult to drive down, especially in the winter when roads are slippery. It also creates issues for snow removal, leaf cleanup, garbage, recycling, pickup. Thank you for your time and listening to our concerns. Best regard, Jenny Jeffers at 625 South Mexico. I just want to read that in the public hearing. Okay. So with the public hearing, you're welcome to come to the podium, state your name and address for the record. Um, again, you can ask questions, but they will not be answered until the actionable item. Um, so if you, is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Except for the bells will probably go on. I'm actually uh, not here to speak on the item. I'm uh, asked, uh, putting in a request that it be held for two weeks until your next meeting. Uh, a neighbor who was not notified by letter because they lived outside the 200 foot limit just found out about uh, the meeting tonight. And he was hoping to get some material together and talk to other neighbors and um, then make uh, a presentation at that meeting if we could hold it for two weeks. Okay, so a request to hold it for two weeks. Yes. The next meeting is in six weeks. Right, it is until the end of July. Um, I guess the other concern is that probably Carl and other people here for this. I'll, I'll come back. Uh -huh. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Who knows? Well, we, okay. can, yeah. we can keep the public. public yeah, I mean, going, it's still the public just, here. We're, yeah. Technically, yeah. we shouldn't be doing yeah like the discussion part right now, but I'm just trying to suss out. And that'd be fine. I mean, if, okay. if, if people have a right to speak, and they can certainly, if this is held, they could come. Right. I think with the public hearing, we still would we go through with public sure. hearing, but we'll talk about your. Suggestion and recommendation probably on the actual item. All right. Um, thank so. you very much. Okay, thank you. That would be good because we don't have to read notice. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, this is part of the public hearing. If there's anyone wishing to speak, you can come to <coughs> your name address at the podium and your comments or concerns. Hi, my name is Bill Doyle. I live at 614 South Quincy, and my concern is the parking. Um, sometimes there's four cars on each side of the street, which it makes it a very narrow to drive down there. I wasn't aware of this until today because I was out of town over the weekend about this happening, and um, I did go to the neighbors and ask them if they opposed to it, and I do have a list of names that people are opposed to it. I will tell you, everybody I talk to on Quincy Street, north of 644, all oppose it for the same reason I do, the parking. They do park in front of the fire hydrant as well. Um, it, it, it's owned R1, and I agree with the email that it should be a single family house. There's people that want to live in the neighborhood, and they don't pay taxes, and um, all the neighbors I talked to, taxes went up significantly, like mine went up $1,300. So besides the fact of the parking, I it's owned residential. It should be left residential, and I don't think it should be um, nonprofit where taxes are not collected. And who do I give this list to? Are the people that oppose it to the? You can have that. Okay. Hey, I'm Shane Bass at 645 South Quincy. I live uh, directly across the street from the property. You might have to set a timer for me too, by I the way. I did set a timer. Know, okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so first of all, it is um, a residential area and, and it's really losing that feel right now. We were already burdened with all the people from Bell and walking. You know, we've got a lot of foot traffic going down there. We got to keep our sidewalks extra clear. This is already, you know, something we've been dealing with a long time. I just think adding more business like facilities in that area is just not going to help that at all. 
Um, parking is a big deal. The fire hydrant is right on my corner in front of my house and it's blocked a lot. And I get very angry when I see that because if my house were to start on fire, that's me who's gonna be suffering on that, not them. Um, uh, it's really hard to mow around there too when they park on that street. I don't know if you've seen the area, but there's a lot of big trees, a lot of big sticks. I, whenever I'm mowing my lawn, if somebody pulls up and parks there, I have to stop, wait for them to leave so I don't hit their car with sticks and trees, you know, sticks and branches on the way. Um, same thing with snow blowing. They'll park right in front of my sidewalk and then I can't snow blow. And I really have to keep that clear again for, you know, the, uh, the Bellwin workers and everybody walking through. Um, Brings a lot of extra traffic onto the streets too. Our streets are already in really bad shape. I don't know if you've been down there. I can't even get to the end of the block without spilling my coffee in my car. So I think that's a concern. Um, you know, having said all that, I gotta say the people that have been over there are seem like very nice people and keep it impeccably clean. No issues with that at all. Um, but it, it's really just a burden, I think, on the neighborhood to have so many people in the neighborhood who don't need to care about the neighborhood. You know, there's no really effort to integrate with anybody who lives in the neighborhood. It's just kind of a house across the street that nobody really knows what goes on. So that's all I have to say. Did I make my time? No, you had a good minute left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Jacobson. Good evening. My name is Bern Jacobson. I live at 639 South Quincy, which is also across the street from the uh, property in question. I um, lived there since 1985. Uh, it was Ethan House at that time, um, but uh, it had more of a neighborhood uh, feel to it because there was a, a gentleman who lived behind me who was a member of their board. I could talk to him if I had questions. I was familiar with the staff. I could talk to them um, when any problem came up. But since it has changed over to what Family Service is doing now, um, the number of cars has gone up, uh, the ins and outs. I, I think uh, you get the idea that the parking is a problem for us. Um, the pickup of trash and, and recycling is at times a problem for us. Uh, I hadn't thought about the fact that, yeah, sometimes mowing the lawn is a problem for us. So. It's a matter of uh, quality of life in the neighborhood and it has changed. I don't envision it getting better with this uh, conditional use permit. My wife sent a, um, uh, an email to uh, Alderman uh, Galvin um, uh, objecting to it. Uh, I don't know if uh, he wants to speak to that or not. Uh, but uh, we would uh, prefer that it not be given a conditional use permit. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Stuck, uh, Program Vice President with Family Services, and I am ultimately responsible for the, the site in question. Um, I would just like to talk in, in favor of the conditional use permit. Um, this, this home has been a community icon in our community since the 1970s. Um, as Ethan House Group Home, Family Services took over the group home um, in, get my dates right here, uh, 20, 2012, and it became the South House in 2017. This is such a critical community resource, and that's why I am just um, making the plea that we strongly consider the, the continued use of the home. I, I would like to say that there might be a little bit of a misconception that it is office space. Um, there is, it is not used as office space. It is used as a community resource for youth and families that we teach independent living skills. It is a place of refuge for kids and adults to go to to get resources, to get help um, for their core issues, where sometimes they don't have a different place to go. Um, staff are always supervising the youth when they are there. And we have tried to give back and be good neighbors. We have never put signage out to call attention. So we do try to maintain it as a family looking home in the community. Um, we do recognize that there absolutely are more cars that out because staff, if they're not there with clients, they're actually um, going to and from 
the home um, to the, the staffs, or I'm sorry, to the clients' homes. I uh, would love to talk about um, opportunities for different parking arrangements and um, how we can be better accommodating um, to the neighborhood. But I would just like to go on records for the strong consideration for the acceptance of the continued use of the property. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? I'd like to speak. Uh, my name is Tim Bazett Jones. I live at 702 South Quincy Street. And I, uh, this is just across Cass Street from South House. And I have a different perspective because I, uh, my daughter attends East High School and one of her classmates about two years ago uh, went through the South House and was able to learn skills there. And that was uh, really important for her. And I've seen that. Um, I do recognize the traffic issues. And I have mentioned that uh, the staff are welcome to uh, park on Cass Street by my house. Um, if there's any, any, there's a lot of room there. So if there's any way that that can alleviate the issues with parking, I would be open to that and support that. Um, so uh, that's, that's my, my perspective on it. All right, thank you so much. That looks like I saw someone else's there. Yeah. If anyone else wishing to speak, forget, you can go ahead, just state your name and address for the record. Hi, uh, my name is Ahmad Rivera Wagner. I live at 617 South Quincy Street, uh, probably two doors down uh, from the property in question. Uh, while I'm really excited about family services, I know that their mission is really important and really powerful. And they've been a great community partner across Green Bay for a very long time. Uh, I'm really thankful for them to have a group home in an amazing uh, neighborhood like uh, Astor, which is absolutely fantastic, incredible. I will say similarly, I've experienced lots of issues with parking on the street. It's also cost issues, caused issues with snow plowing and things of that nature. These are uh, folks that, uh, while also doing incredibly great work, um, are there's often lots of cars there and, and frankly was a bit surprised to hear about this plan change given that uh, we've I've seen a lot of uh, more use of cars more than I have since I've moved here about three years ago uh, and so the other really big important thing for me is that uh, this neighborhood is an incredible neighborhood where lots of folks are interested we already have an incredible housing shortage we would me I think it's wonderful to have a group home in the neighborhood given that that was a place for people to reside and for people to live, but to take some property of this magnitude uh, off the rolls uh, for people to live in, to serve in a business oriented way, both adds to the uh, uh, physical, more, more physical traffic, both human and car, uh, but it also just uh, takes away from a desperately needed housing in our community. And we would like to see more people being able to uh, live in our neighborhood, whether that's renting, uh, residing temporarily, whether that's being a, a, a single family house. Uh, they are desperately need that in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And so this just seems somewhat unfortunate given that just less than a block away, uh, there's lots of vacant properties that can be used for commercial purposes. And if there was some way, if there are more commercial interests of the, of, uh, the family services that there is within blocks uh, with uh, completely zoned areas for that. But this is a, a deeply residential neighborhood uh, where uh, we really appreciate how neighborly uh, folks have been. And I think adding a business in the heart of this uh, part of the neighborhood or any part of the neighborhood that isn't already zoned for that uh, takes away from the character ultimately of the neighborhood. Again, uh, thinking that the family services, a group home has been in our neighborhood for such a long time. They've been uh, great neighbors as that, but over the last year, we can have seen, I have seen uh, the difference in traffic just from if there have already been some adjustments. So I just would like to note my uh, opposition uh, to this and uh, looking forward to figuring out other ways that we can work with family services in our neighborhood to have people reside there and get the services they need. Thank you so much. All right, is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? I'm just gonna ask real quick uh, to withdraw my request. Okay. Uh, the way I was under the impression no one was gonna be here to speak. Oh. Then um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, you guys hear me? 
Oh, hold up just a moment, please. Oh, sorry about that. So I'm I'm gonna withdraw that. Okay, so we're not we're not requesting. You guys that. move forward as you see fit. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, whoever was calling in, iPhone 34. <laughs> you can yeah, see. that's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, if you could just state your name and address, please. Sorry, I'm at work, so I called in. Uh, my name's Greg Gross. I live at 631 South Quincy. Um, and I've just got to say that uh, traffic is getting pretty bad on our street. So um, I'm not big on seeing more traffic. Uh, But other than that, I mean, it, I like seeing what they're doing, but I just don't like the traffic. So I'm gonna have to let you go. It's so noisy in here. I'm sorry for that. All right, thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Let the record reflect that no one came forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item number five. Consideration with possible action on a request for a conditional use permit at 644 South Quincy Street for personal service office use in the low density residential district submitted by Family Services of Northeast Wisconsin on behalf of Ethan House Inc. property. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Can I kind of give you the background before the public hearing? I will hit on a couple items. I mean, you're all very familiar with the seven uh, criteria for a conditional use permit, but a lot of times people either request that the city allow commercial activities in residential areas or wonder why it's there. So I just wanted to mention that retail and personal service uses are permitted in our single family districts um, with the CUP and they have to meet a minimum of four criteria. The first is that the maximum gross floor area devoted to the use shall not exceed 2,500 square feet. The use shall occupy a corner of a property, so it's got to be a corner lot, which this one is. That no retail, no retail or service business shall be constructed, and no residential building shall be wholly or partially converted to such a use within 300 feet of another one. Uh, no more than one retail or service business shall be located within the same block. And two off street parking spaces shall be provided in addition to those required by the residential use. Um, so, in this case, it meets those criteria. Um, they have two parking stalls within the garage, two outside, and three parking passes. At least that was what was in their uh, application package. So, with that said, the, the proposed use of all the relevant standards um, and it's not contrary to the existing land use in the immediate neighborhood. It does meet the standards and staff's opinion of the CUP approval. Um, however, we are rec recommending some additional conditions based on the historic nature of the structure and the change from a residential to a commercial use. And um, those are, uh, we are recommending approval. The first is that any modification of the building necessary to establish a commercial use per the building code shall be approved by the Green Bay Landmarks Commission. If the South House uh, use as applied for in your packet is discontinued, the operation is dissolved, or if Family Services of Northeast Wisconsin no longer operates or manages the facility, the use shall terminate immediately. The use operation shall not be reestablished without planning commission and council approval. That the hours of operation for office use be limited between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. and that compliance with all other regulations that we just Okay. Thank you, Dave. Sure, if I can start with point of order. Is yeah, go ahead. For those who are listening, and I think there's an audio issue, so maybe just someone wants to say something. It might just be that I lost my voice and I'm not as loud as usual. I think there was someone. Yeah, the, um, he was saying that he can hear really well when people are speaking at the podium, but when we're speaking at the table, he's having a hard time hearing. So maybe just <coughs> the there extra vocal. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> and if I can ask a question of staff. Um, two questions. First of all, how many people were living in the group home when it was last used? Was I believe it was eight. Eight people. So the, the transition from group home to um, 
office use was unnoticed by the city, okay. at least by the planning office. Um, it only came to light just recently, which is why they applied for the conditional use. Um, they immediately or applied. I was going to say, so there's no change from what's going on right now to what they're asking for. Well, from what has been going on, they, they oh, technically okay. did not have approval for right. the, for that use. Yes. Follow up to that. You know, I think one of the big questions that's come up quite a bit is why this particular location and not an office space. It sounds fairly restrictive. I mean, if the office operation hours are between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., it sounds like parking keeps coming up, all these issues. Why this particular home? That would probably, if you decide to open the floor to ask the applicant, it would probably be a, a more appropriate question for them. Okay. I have a guess, but I don't want to guess. No. <laughs> I have, I have a question that probably won't require you to guess. Um, this is a 3,000 square foot structure. Approximately each Approximately. floor when you have the floor. I could not get a good reading on how many. It's, it's exempt, so it's a tax exempt property. So our assessor <coughs> oh, got it. smaller. So I basically took the footprint and then added the floor and a half. I was curious then about the um, prohibition of more than 2,500 square feet being devoted to the office-related use. Yeah, that is something that's written in the code. Uh, my understanding that it's written in the code intentionally to keep the commercial use in the neighborhood at a minimum. So it's really what it, but my understanding of that section of the code is really designed for this type of use, an office on the corner or a small grocer or a tax accountant or, or somebody that would that could run a commercial use in a neighborhood. So I believe the 2,500 square feet would potentially place on there so it didn't get very large. That also plays into the parking count. Um, the more commercial space you have, the more parking you need typically. So by limiting the 2,500, um, that has the cascade effect of also limiting sort of the activity. But of course, your recommendation then is overriding the 2,500. No, they would not. They would still have to. I was just stating that that's the largest building. Okay. Right. So, I mean, if there's an attic, a thousand square feet or 500 square feet, that would not be able to be used for the office, but you can use it for storage or something. Thank you. Um, and ideally, it would be a mix of housing and commercial, right? I mean, mm -hmm. typically what you see. I always think of the uh, people far enough back. We don't have a lot of them in town, but like the corner store that people mm -hmm. lived above. Especially in the historic areas, and then we're in the business below. That's sort of the same type of scenario that mm -hmm. we established that in current times. Nobody ever knows that, but our code is written that way, and it does allow that. Yeah. It was pretty progressive when it was drafted. So, if I can add on that, I see what you're saying with the additional space. So, it's their use cannot exceed the 2,500 square feet, Correct. but if it was storage for that use, wouldn't that also be part of that use? Could be, yes. right? I would think. So to me, I'm just seeing that as exceeding, the, so we wouldn't meet that minimum requirement for number one. Correct, if they were using it. Yeah. I guess we'd have to get clarification on how much square footage is actually being utilized for this use. Right. Well, you can put that clarification here, or it would be the inspector's job when the site plans come in to show the redesign of the interior, if there is any, how much space is devoted and what space is not being used. Okay. I mean, a, you know, a basement could technically be just a mechanical room for the house, not really being used. Sure. So there are ways to kind of deal with that. But again, I didn't have an interior layout. I didn't want to square footage, so it isn't. Okay. That might not even be three thousand. Might not even be the average. Right. 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 Just for seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, quick question. Um, and it's been a while since we were. Yeah, <laughs> we seem to be refreshed by it. Googling. So, um, saying that the property met all our conditions, can you? Um, align this for Act 667. We're just Act 667 and then meet all the criteria 
Oh, uh, yeah. It's what we find recently. Yeah, I don't think yeah. it was 66. I don't know which one. It's 67. 67. Sorry. Um, yeah, so basically that is if there is impact, if the use is not having an impact because of itself, that it's needing to be supportive. That additional use in the code, um, if it doesn't have any found impact, um, whether negative or however you want to determine that impact, you can either do one is put conditions on it to mitigate that impact, or it could be denied at that point. So, and that I did want to mention, I had it on a couple of agendas, but I never wanted to make them longer. So that since Act 67 was approved, there have been a lot of court cases challenging <laughs> it. Um, and the courts have ruled that that proof, the, the hard municipal has to prove everything has been uh, kind of removed. That the proof doesn't have to be as super intense as what the original thought it would have to be. Um, and it just, you just have to, reason, a reasonable person has to see an impact. So not just general opinion, like we don't like it, it actually has to have an impact. And as, as I recall, that came up in partial reference to the party houses. And sure. with a matter of uh, the state saying, you can't just say X number of neighbors object. Right. It has to be the reasons for which they object. And whether or not those reasons are, are substantial. I felt the way the government thought. Yep. Yes. By Thank reasonable, you. and the way the courts put it, I don't have it in front of me, but it was a reasonable person would recognize this impact. Yes. Uh, prior to that, they wanted you know studies and that kind of stuff. So the court basically found that no, you don't have to spend all that money to find that information. So in <coughs> this case, the number of names on the Petition the general was so good to bring doesn't count, but the repeated reference to the parking issue would. Correct? Thank yes. you. Just on its own merit. I mean, yeah. I think you'd have to find out why those people also objected. They may have different reasons right. that would add to it. So I had heard the parking, I had heard the maintenance, traffic, the lack of housing, uh, lack of housing. And the uh, effect, potential change in the character of the neighborhood you know, based on an office. Those are that's what I have. The comments. Thank you, Dave. I might be done. <laughs> Any other questions? I'd like to move to open the floor. Second. A motion by Commissioner Femmer, a second by Commissioner Breck. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Do you want to hear from the applicant first? We have questions Absolutely. for the applicant. If if you would come forward, please. Stay. Stay. Do we have questions? Was there anything else that you wanted to add as far as the hearing? I mean, you spoke at the end, so. Um. I. Can I respond to a absolutely okay um, an earlier question? Um, why this house versus office space is is a valid question. Um, the things that we do and provide for the kids and families are not conducive with a traditional office space. Um, the home environment allows us to provide a much more relaxed and a true home-like environment where many of these youth that we have, that we bring back to the house, um, have a very chaotic household environment and a very unsafe household environment. Um, so we try to role model we do <coughs> independent living skills. A traditional office space does not allow us to cook a meal together and sit around a kitchen table and role model how you can have healthy conversations and how you be together uh, modeling kind of that family environment. We can't do that in offices. Uh, we can't do laundry, um, teach them independent living skills. We can't teach them how to maintain a home and what it's going to take when they become an adult. Um, we work with some adults that don't know how to do that. Um, last year, I helped an adult plant flowers that she said, I've never planted a flower before. Um, and we have worked hard to beautify that property, much more so than when it was a group home, actually. 
Um, so that answers the question why, you know, what does that home provide us um, where an office space cannot give us even a fraction of what we are able to do and, and role model within that home environment. Could you say a bit more about the kinds of activities because now it begins to sound like a, a homey lab, if you would. And that is more <laughs> I think what it is versus office space. Um, we do have a room or two in the home that is dedicated to staff as their office to do their notes. <coughs> All of our kids and families are referred to us by the County of Health and Human Service Department. Um, so these are youth that are troubled, that are struggling um, with some core issues in their lives. Sometimes they get kicked out of school and need a place to be and need supervision. So we're bringing them back well supervised, <laughs> allowing them a space to do their schoolwork and then we get them back into the school environment. Um, we do, um, some talking groups within the living rooms that we have set up that are very um, trauma informed is a is a buzzword in the mental health field, um, a very comforting home like setting very peacefully um, painted walls and inviting artwork on the walls, um, where we can give them that just calms them and able to talk through some of the really difficult things that are going on with them sometimes, um, so we can help them regulate and get back into their whether it's a school environment or home environment or those types of things. Um, every day, I, if I go into the house um, to drop something off or answer a staff question or deliver something, um, there are all sorts of arts and crafts activities going on. There is cooking going on. There is a load of laundry and the washer dryer. Um, there's kids playing board games and video games. And that's um, more often the activities that are taking place there. Are there any overnight stays involved? There are not. Um, have not been since we closed down the group home as we knew it um, prior to Ethan House. And how many staff members would have to be focused on that property? Have their office, so to speak, on the property? So we have a total of um, six full time staff and a couple casual part time or very part time staff right now. Um, and then myself that I may. Um, come a couple times a week, as well as my director, um, who is sitting next to me, Don Van Lannan. So um, not more than eight or so um, staff at the most. And again, they do come and go using that as um, their hub. You've heard that there's a lot of concern about traffic, and I want to ask two questions related to that. Sure. Can you give us a sense of how many clients you have coming in and out of the house in any in a, a normal day? Um, I would say in a normal day throughout that day, um, mm -hmm. I would say upwards of six, um, potentially up to about six throughout the day. Plus your six staff. Yes. And um, so the, the clients are coming in basically they spend most of the day there. Um, not necessarily, it varies. Um, some might be there just an hour or two hours. Some might be there three, four hours. Um, rarely do we have a youth that is there for more than four or five hours at the most. Um, that could be a time that there's something pretty significant going back in their home environment or happening in the school environment that causes them to be with us for an extended period of time. That's very helpful. And do you have any thoughts about how you would propose dealing with the property? Absolutely. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we did have a neighbor knock on our door and express concern with parking. Um, we worked with that neighbor and we addressed that scenario at that point in time. We have not necessarily heard anyone come forward previous to um, tonight with serious parking concerns. Um, I can understand that the volume of cars coming and going would raise some issues. So, um, you know, up until this point in time, we have had staff park in the driveway. I think they tend to veer towards the street because a matter of convenience or if they're coming and going within an hour, um, you know, someone has to drop what they're doing and go out and move their car if they're in their driveway. Um, but that is not an excuse. And that's just something we haven't considered before. So. Um, we could have a car in the garage, we could have up to four cars consistently in the driveway versus the street. So that is absolutely something we could 
most definitely consider. Um, I have heard concerns with parking on both sides of the streets too. Um, you know, if we parked on one side only, that may alleviate some. Um, we heard one of the other neighbors, Tim, um, recently caught us last week and said, start parking on my side on Cass. Um, could fit several cars there. So that is, that's another option as well. A sign reminding people about not parking in front of a hybrid. Yes, so that was, really that was concerning to me as well. So <laughs> yes, I that's had so no easy. idea and that does not make me happy <laughs> as well. And when I come, I usually tend to park in the driveway or on cast so I don't necessarily look that direction so I apologize and I am not happy about that either that's there's no excuse for that a question on the hours you're it said in the you said you're proposing eight to six on weekdays but then what's being proposed is that six to eight sounds excuse me eight to six sounds like it would be universal across all days is that correct Staff. That's what staff is recommending. Yes, we would, we would figure those are business hours. Yeah. Is that problematic for the program or for the uh, weekends, especially that it mentions that you're saying that you know, flexibility on the weekends mm -hmm. would be across the board on some days a week? I wouldn't say it's problematic. Um, currently, we go past 6 p.m. on occasion. Um, sometimes those evening hours are the most volatile for the youth and families that we work with. So, um, you know, consideration even a little bit later would be would be helpful but um we would make that work if it was eight to six what do you currently operate for how are you currently operating high lives um i would say there are there are some days we're absolutely done by five or six p.m um there might be a, an evening or two per week that we tend to go a little bit longer um to until seven or eight p.m we're typically not um, working any later than eight p.m One final question for me. Do you have other homes like this in the area or other locations that you do the same program at, or is this your only? This is um, our only home. Um, we have a residential treatment facility that um, houses youth 24 um, 7, but we do not have a, a home like environment. Okay. And I guess, how long have you been operating in this capacity? That we're applying for right now. How long has it been going on this way? Uh, basically, since about 2018, mm -hmm. is oh. we have run kind of the more of the community based um, okay. work versus the the traditional group home that it had been. Right. So nothing. That, how you operate is not really changing from 2018 to today. It's just okay. All just right. the Getting volume the ducks in of a row. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Volume of cars and um, comings and going. So about 2018 was the last time someone resided on the property. Yes. <coughs> Do you have any more questions for the applicant? I'm going to proceed. Oh, oh, we might have somebody else who wishes to see your party. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else that would wish to speak on this item? Sure, I would. Okay. <laughs> State your name and address for the record, please. Shane Bass at 645 South. <laughs> um, you know, after hearing that, I definitely agree that it is a nice place for that kind of work. I'm not arguing that at all. Um, and I did make a list before I came on some things that maybe suggestions that would make it a little better for us. And I can read those right now if uh, you're interested. One of them would be to maybe make their parking area larger on the Cass Street side and have the staff park back there, you know, that would at least take half of it off of the Quincy Street side, which is where we all live and, and where we're really seeing the burden. Um, the parking in that area is already restricted because of the hospital. I know it's no parking in a lot of places because of that. I don't know if it's possible to have parking just for family services, you know. Um, that might be something. Another one would be to clearly mark that fire hydrant zone as a no parking zone on the street. Um, maybe even paint lines on the street for parking so you don't have people with big gaps so you can get more cars in there. Um, and even block some of those parking for and have them reserved for residents. Might be some ideas on how to make that a little better. Um, so I just wanted to 
You can all say that as well. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Just want a clarification from David. Did you say the city or the planning commission is recommending in favor of uh, granting the conditional use? Staff is. The staff is? Yes. And how did, how did you guys arrive at that? Uh, it meets all the general conditions of the conditional use permit. So it's like a vote? Well, no, we discuss it and then we draft up our own okay. staff opinion. Okay. It's different every time. Okay. And then it's zone R1, correct? Correct. So they've been using it, basically violating the zoning since 2018 when they changed. So I'm curious why this hasn't come up before since it's been zoned R1. We so were they, not made aware of it. You were not made aware of it. Correct. So Our family assessor, services didn't ask. Yes, the assessor software and the permit software all show it as a group home. Okay. So basically family services didn't ask for permission to use it for this. Uh, they just were violating the zoning and this just came up recently. Yeah, I believe they didn't understand that they needed to. But they did, they didn't okay. okay, thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Can I go again? <laughs> it's actually a question. Okay, I think from All right. I think I heard you say earlier that one of the conditions of this is that there can't be another zoning like this within so many feet. Does that mean that if I want to use my house as an office, if you have a corner lot, I would not. And you have twenty five hundred square feet. I do. Read off, but he, but there's another not, condition that said two hundred square feet. Then no. Well, and there's a difference. Okay, so a, a home office could potentially be a home occupation as well, which would be permitted. This would be converting to a professional service or retail type use that has coming and going of customers. Home office. Okay. So if I had that, clients coming and going now. Well, you'd only be allowed, I believe it's four maximum at a time. Okay. Um, you can't have any outside employees. You can't do any storage, you can't have any signage. There's a whole section of the code dealing with home occupations, which is different than a commercial use in a residential district. Okay, okay, understood. And then the other one is you you did say that if family service ever ceases in that building, that this permit would the no CUP. longer be valid. Nobody could come by and build, a, build a new them. building or anything like that. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? <coughs> Motion to close the floor. Second. Motion by Vice Chair Miller, second by Commissioner Frank to close the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. <coughs> clarification for the staff going off of that, that we could revisit the CUP at any time. Um, no, no. You could revisit it if, um, if they change use or discontinues for a 12 month period. But yeah, you can open it up. Any opposed? Any I think it's fair to say there's not much of a issue with the usage that's happening. It seems to just be around parking, which I don't think, while this is a little bit more intensive use in a residential home, I don't think it's the entire reason it's a congested area for parking. And I don't think that's the reason we should hold it against this proposal. I would like to see more enforcement um, within the area if we could pass on a note via the alder or whatever means to maybe have a little more patrols in the area. I believe it is a parking permitted area as well, if I remember, um, which I live in Astor as well. I, I know they don't check that all that often, but we could maybe request a little bit more uh, rounds by the parking staff. They love to do uh, tickets downtown. They might as well take a little swing over there. <laughs> um, so maybe just pass along a note for more enforcement there, uh, maybe some more signage, but uh, with all that said, I don't have any issue with the usage and would move to approve. And I will second that. Is that a motion? Yes. But I think too, it doesn't sound like Family Services was fully aware of the parking situation before today. Because <laughs> I mean, she's shaking her head. I mean, so maybe now that they're she's made aware of that, that they can work on that as well. But I feel like that's. 
the biggest issue, the whole fire hydrant. I mean, you learn that in driver's ed, you're not supposed to park in front of it. But yeah, I mean, that's a, an enforcement issue. Yeah. And, and legally, there's nothing. It's a substantial evidence mm -hmm. as I'm reading the law. Oh. I'm just saying, general <laughs> people. Oh, that's, 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 that's so, okay, right. So we've got a motion. Another clarification from staff. Mm -hmm. but, um, on item four here, two off-street parking spaces shall be provided in addition to those required. So those just that there's off-street parking available in the area, or is that sure there's permitted parking? Yeah, there's uh okay. well we wouldn't call it the permitted parking. I just showed that for clarification that could change if the council just makes it no parking. Mm -hmm. um, but there are two garage stalls, there are two stalls behind. So they're at four and there is no residential use. Okay. Yeah, two. Right. They'd be Got required it. to have one for five hundred square feet at twenty five hundred would be a maximum. I would point out that particularly managing the four garage stalls would be the staff to make sure that the parking is keeps the area right in front of the house clear for the clients coming in. It should be pretty doable. And I've seen you nodding all the way along in, in support of dealing with that. <coughs> so I did second before. I wasn't sure if you heard me, Madam Chair. I did. Okay. All right. So we've got a motion by Vice Chair Miller, a second by Commissioner Bremer. Is there any further discussion? Nice. Still concerned is that we're getting rid of. I know it hasn't been used like that since 2018. But we've been hearing about housing that's, that's come up, and we're getting rid of eight beds basically in a very residential area. So, I mean, that's my bigger concern. Eight beds I haven't been there for five years. Right. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, but I don't think we can take that into consideration, to be honest. It's private use. They're, if they're, they were going to get rid of the house, raise it, that would be a, a problem. But one of the conditions is that they keep it in order and we have to go through landmarks to get any changes to it. So the house is being maintained. We can't stipulate use as long as it's within the zoning, which in this case it is via the CUP. Any further discussion? All right, motion by Vice Chair Miller, second by Commissioner Bremer. All those in... Do you think you need? I don't know. Yeah, just turn the pot. I don't think it can be All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. All right. So we've got a nay from Alder Hutchinson and a nay from uh, Commissioner Ravitsky. <laughs> I swear. Older, older was he, a nay or a yay? he was a nay. He was a yay. Oh, was he? I'm sorry. <laughs> yay. I was a yay. Okay. He was a yay. All right. So we've got Commissioner Rubinsky on. And then what is the next city council meeting? 27th. I was just going to say. Is that what you were adding? <laughs> yeah, okay. Say, yeah, it's the 27th of this month. Yeah. Because in our next meeting is July. So June 27th. Was there something else or were you just giving me the date of the meeting? All right, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. All right, and then uh, back to regular business, moving on to item number one, election of officers. Okay, so can we move it to the back? Sure, because there's other people here. Yeah, let's try to, we're already taking up time. Can we do that? Can we move the election of officers to right above the- So it was just motion to move. Yeah. Okay, motion to move item one to the back of the agenda. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So we're moving that. Okay. So moving on to item number two, which is a public hearing. This public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the press times. The Planning Commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject agenda items. And we invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, and whether you favor, oppose, or are only providing information in this matter. We will now open the public hearing on item number two, public hearing on the request for a planned unit development at 1265 Lombardi Avenue for campus signage package submitted by Green Bay Packers, Inc. on behalf of the City of Green Bay property owner. Um, so this is a request for a plan unit development primarily for a signage plan for the 
primarily for a signage plan for the Lambeau Field Sports Campus, as I'm referring to it in the staff report. Um, so the site itself, I think everybody's familiar with where it is. We're at Jonita Lombardi. Um, if you can go back one, Dina, please. Um, to the north, you have basically single-family <coughs> residents, um, many of which are have been converted to short-term rental properties. Um, and you have the village of Ashwabanan on the east, west, and south. The south is primarily the same type of scenario, singles and twos, mainly short-term <coughs> rentals at this time, my understanding. Uh, to the east is also an extension of an event center, the Resh, um, and the other things that are there. To the west is um, Title Town, which is uh, also, I would say, an extension of the sports complex. So you kind of have that, that stretch. The site itself is 60 acres in size, so it's very, very large. It's owned by the city of Green Bay. Um, leased out to the Green Bay Packers. It was established in 1957. Um, and since that time, since 57, it's had a variety and a lot of different signage over time. So um, over the last 50 years, I would say, at least in my experience, um, the signage has increased and changed and altered. Um, but you really have a mix of three types of signs. You have identity signage. You'll see that with the G's. You'll see that with Lambo Field. It has sponsorship signage. So you'll see Invisalign Gate or Oneida Gate. Um, and then it's got a lot of directional signage. Um, our code deals with these types of sites uh, in a public institutional school <coughs> on a much smaller scale. So our directional sign is, is uh, only allowed to be six square feet. So the little signs that say parking or you know, drive through that way, um, they don't really apply to large campuses. So an example would be NWTC has a PV for signage and other things. UWGB has the same thing. Um, any large campus type setting typically has that. So over the last couple of years, we've received uh, quite a few inquiries from uh, sign companies typically in the Packers Association. Um, to increase signage or change out signage, um, they have uh, years ago just just did it. The city just let them do it, even though it didn't necessarily meet code. More recently, since the '90s, they've been coming through primarily with variances, board of appeals variances. Uh, hardship, typically being that this use is not typical and falls outside of the realm of the, uh, the zoning code. Um, so when it came through this last time. Uh, staff had recommended that we codify all the signage because it's in getting increasingly more difficult to get variances to prove a hardship um, with the level of signage that's on the site currently. Um, so that is what they did. They supplied us with an audit and that is in your packet, basically an inventory of all exterior signs, either on the building, on the ground, on poles, uh, listed them all out and what they did in, for the ability to increase and change those out and quasi change out logos and such, um, they just added 10% to each one of their sizes. Um, so, to kind of give you an example of what's out there right now, overall signage, not breaking it down, but it is in your packet. There's about 325 signs out there. Um, currently, it's about 30,000, a little over 30,000 square foot of signage. Um, again, 60 acre parcel. So they would be increasing that by 10% to basically 30, 34,000, just under 34,000 square feet. So again, 10% increase. Um, and I, I will just say all the weary, uh, the Lamb Lombardi Neighborhood Association and the Village of Schwabenon, as well as property owners <coughs> 400 feet, um, have been noticed, um, request. We have not, we received some questioning inquiries. Uh, but no in favor or against. And I'll wait to give you the recommendation. All right, thank you. All right, and again, with this public hearing, you can ask questions, but they will not be answered by staff until the actionable item. Um, is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Corey Benke, 1213 Shadow Lane. I live there. It's not a party house. Please don't call it a party house. <laughs> uh, also, I would say not mainly, I would say majority party houses, but I do take yes. exception at the word yes. mainly. Um, what is it? Like, are they just asking for 10% more signage space overall? Because one of my one issues with, I love the Packers. I literally live across the street from the pro shop. 
and I'm there because I love it. But I feel like they're kind of given carte blanche for that area for a lot of things, like especially Titletown Village, not having like a Starbucks, like 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 some of the things they're allowed to do seem kind of insular and not necessarily for the community, like having things for the community, and that's a concern. Um, but I'll take all the signage I can get. I just I didn't understand what it was. That's why I'm here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? <laughs> Jerry Hansen, Staff Counsel for Green Bay Packers. Thanks for uh, going through all this. And yes, I've been here many times uh, asking for different signs. Uh, overall, the big picture is the 10% <coughs> is we don't have any intention currently to change any signs whatsoever. The key here is if we did want to change a sign and increase a specific sign, give us some leeway to, to do that without having to come back here every time. And that's really the main purpose, codify the whole thing. Uh, again, no intention to change any signs right now. Uh, that 10% just gives us some leeway in the future. We're hoping that we, we, um, we um, don't do much. I think we've tried to look at it historically too and, and look into the future. I don't, there's no other plans for any future locations and things like that. Uh, when we do, uh, you know, potentially some major things, we're going to have to come back anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I know it's the public hearing, but that is a very good point in that generally major improvements in that will probably require a whole campus view, oh, which the science would get folded in at that point. Right. Um, but at this time, there was just kind of an urgency with the scoreboard and all that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Yeah. Yes, I, I would like to speak, please. Go ahead, CJ, address for the record, please. Yes, my name is Paul Hillen. I live at 1229 Shadow Lane. Uh, also not a rental. Um, that was an interesting <laughs> comment that was made. Well, um, I think I think the majority houses there are not rented. Um, I have quite a few questions and I know that um, you said that they will not necessarily be answered this evening, but I think that they're important. And the letter that we received really didn't explain much. Um, my first question, and I'll state all the questions and then I know that you'll address them in your normal business. One is I was um, quite interested to understand why this is a PUD if it's only for signage. And as a result of that, because that's a planned unit development, which is normally housing. Um, so the first thing is how will this impact our property on Shadow Lane? Um, how will it, if it is approved, what does the PUD allow the Packers to do in the future relative to our house and our residents on Shadow Lane? Um, and then I was also quite interested to see and hear with the outline of our homes on Shadow Lane that it was part of the Packer campus. So that was also an interesting statement. Is Shadow Lane considered to be part of the Packers campus. So those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the site? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Let the record reflect that no one came forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item number three, consideration with possible action on a request for a planned unit development at 1265 Lombardi Avenue for campus signage package submitted by Green Bay Packers Inc. Petitioner, City of Green Bay property owner. Sure, I guess I'm just gonna give a quick recommendation from staff um, and then I will address Paul's two questions if you don't mind. Okay, so the, camp the campus, as I had mentioned, is six acres, it's large. There's a lot of existing signage on site, um, but when you look at the site itself, um, and you know you don't have to, but if, <laughs> if you look at the site, <laughs> it does not appear very excessive. 
um, at least to, to staff. Um, so we recognize the standards associated with science in the zoning code are really not meant for a large campus like this. They're really meant for a one-off building on individual lots. Um, and the code itself is not equipped to address those unique needs of a national sports franchise, um, which is very different. But also, same thing with universities. Um, um, we don't believe that the 10% increase in proposed sign package uh, would be inconsistent with the intent of the sign regulations, which is basically a clutter regulation. Um, and we don't believe it would harm the public interest. And I want to point out that should additional signage be proposed on the site that isn't already exempt in our code, there are certain signs that are exempt, um, that they would have to come back through the Planning Commission and Council to amend that. Um, so we are recommending approval of the request subject to the plan to make development, which um, in the packet will show every sign and how big it is and a picture of where it's at. And with that said, so the three questions is why would the PUB uh, only be for signage? And would this impact the uh, neighboring lots um, on shadow primarily? Uh, no, this PUD is for signage primarily because they're changing up some signage right now. Uh, they can't get permits to do that because they're in excess of the sign code. So we're just putting the signage package up. That's why there's not a lot. I believe the package didn't have much to add at this time. Maybe they won't in the future, uh, but uh, that's really what that's for. Um, the second one, uh, what can be done in the future? Uh, basically, they can increase the signage that they have on their audit by 10%. Um, they could do any other building work that is uh, meets the code. Um, if it doesn't, they would either have to go through a variance or what we suspect will happen is a full plan development over the entire property. So a plan development can be something as simple as signage or it can be as complicated to regulate everything on the property, including landscaping, including parking, including housing. They can be commercial, they can be industrial, they can be agricultural. Um, it's just basically a plan development is, plan unit development is where we're writing a quote over the top of the property. And then the third is Shadow Lane, part of the Packers campus. It is not. Um, the campus is the 60 acres bound uh, by the red line. I think what uh, uh, Mr. Killian may be referring to is that dash line, which is the plan commission's notification policy. So that's the distance that those letters were sent out. Um, plan commission <coughs> sends letters out 200 feet for properties under three acres, 400 feet for properties over three acres. And that dash line is the notification area. The red line around the lot, I guess it's kind of hard to see. That's where the PUD would be, it just covers that parcel. So it should not have any impact on shadow lane properties, except they may see a little bit larger signage over time by 10%. And that's 10% of what they currently have, which is 30,000. So you're talking about 3,000. About 3,500 uh, square feet, but it would be each sign itself. So when you look at the sign up, the sign is uh, 10 square feet right now, it would be allowed to go up to 11 square feet. Yeah, because it's a 10 oh, square feet. Oh, this is 10 per sign. Oh, 10 per sign. Okay. Those, those <coughs> aggregate numbers were just to let you guys know how much I ground see. signage versus wall signage versus, uh, I think I called them full signage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just out there. It's just there. But if they, idea. To, if they wanted to add a sign, that would change the PV. They would have to amend it, okay. unless it was already a sign. Okay. Thanks. That was one of my questions. The other one was, does this have any impact on the IT impact on signs? And I'm asking that on behalf of the neighborhood across the street. Um, if it's a lit sign, it could be a 10% bigger lit sign. Okay. <laughs> I do want to offer my apology for having used the prohibited term party house. <laughs> I am just processing all the applications yes. right now. So yes. there's a lot of much. Uh, well, I was, on the, I was on the council when we had one after another, after another, after another of the applications for the short term rentals. And uh, it was politically uh, difficult. This is a point of clarification for staff to the Lombardi Neighborhood Association, unfortunately defunct at the moment. So. Mm. Mm. 
If you're writing to them, they won't respond back. That's <laughs> 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 probably why they didn't respond to anybody. Yeah, but they're unfortunately inactive at the moment. All right. I just make a motion to approve. Second. Do a motion by Commissioner Ravinsky, second by Commissioner Craddock. Do we have any further discussion? Um, this is Alder Hutchison. Um, I was a member of the Board of Appeals for three or four years, and the Packer organization came before us at least three or four times with sign changes. I think this makes sense to approve the plan so they don't have to come before us unless it's a major change. Um, because it is, I get the idea that the Packers get carte blanche, and they do and they don't. They're, I think they're trying to play by the rules. And I think this rule that we're changing now makes a lot of sense. And they have tried to, you know, uphold what the rules are with the city and this would make it easier. I just wanted to uh, make that comment uh, because there is that sense of one or the other. And I think in this case, the Packers are trying to do the right thing. Okay, so we have the motion by Commissioner Ravinsky, the second by Commissioner Craddock. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, and then that will move forward then to City Council for June 27th. Thank you. To item number six, which is a public hearing, and this public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the press times. The planning commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject agenda items, and we invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, whether you favor, oppose, or only providing information, and your comments or concerns. We will now open the public hearing on item number six. Public hearing on a request for a conditional use permit at 1809 Deckner Avenue for a community living arrangement serving nine or more persons in an office residential zoning district submitted by Paula Jolly of Mandolin Found Foundation on behalf of Old Number 5 LLC's property owner. Thank you. Uh, so the property in question is at the corner of Deckner and Henry. This is the old number five fire station that was in use until the mid 90s and has now had some office uses uh, here over the past decade. It's been vacant for a while. Um, the folks at the Manland Foundation came to us asking for this use um, at the site as it is a uh, conditional use when it is over nine or more persons. If it was under eight persons, it'd be a permitted use. Mm -hmm. And it was in the district. Um, the Manland Foundation has. Um, an existing amount is now Webster uh, as a permitted use uh, based off of the district is in and the amount of uh, residents that are inside of uh, the facility itself. Um, surrounding the area is a, a, a mix of uses. Uh, uh, we have uh, OR uh, to both the uh, north, east, and west. Uh, there's the uh, City Municipal Garage uh, to the northeast, a medical center to the west and to the south. It's a mix. Of single and two family residential uh, homes in the R1 uh, district. Um, the site itself is uh, just over one acre at 1.12 acres. It's a, a, a single parcel that uh, has the existing two story building um, and parking on both the north and south sides. Uh, so, the Manhattan Foundation is seeking to operate a man's house, a community living arrangement with a projected space for 20 individuals living inside. The building uh, as part of your packet use and some uh, plenary plans as to renovate uh, the facilities inside, uh, primarily located in the western part of uh, the facility itself. Uh, as just a refresher, the CLA is defined as the following community based residential facility needs a place where five or more adults who are not related to the operator or administrator and do not require care of both intermediate level nursing care reside and receive care, treatment, or services that are above level of room and board, but includes no more than three hours of nursing care for us in one week. Um, so uh, it's not in their attached business plan. Their services don't go above intermediate care, but they do offer um, meetings with staff and a structured environment uh, for women and their families 
uh, who are seeking a CLA to help uh, uh, substance abuse and mental health disorders. Um, this will not be a freebie. There is rent for each of the uh, residents. Uh, right now, the rent is at $425 for adults and $125 for children. Uh, there's a mix of staff members and volunteers uh, that the Mental Condition Foundation would have to support uh, approximately every five residents for one staff member or volunteer um, at the site. Um, the uh, intent is to uh, lease and redevelop the, uh, the property at the old firehouse. Um, there are in the preliminary plans um, at least nine bedrooms, two full bathrooms, two half bathrooms, two living rooms, a group dining room, a large kitchen space with up to two separate kitchen prep areas, and a laundry room as well as office spaces. Um, the foundation is seeking to get financial backing to make this work and uh, uh, has looked into potentially uh, expanding beyond uh, just the western part of the building. If they were and this were to be approved, there would be further um, approvals at that time. Uh, the foundation held a neighborhood meeting back on May 31st at its own church. Um, there were staff, volunteers, and uh, uh, their uh, professional uh, uh, staff with the controllers were present. However, no neighbors attended. Um, we have uh, received uh, one call, uh, just general inquiries, and then we received a letter of support um, from the folks over at Stillman uh, Brewery. Uh, to, to the site. Um, so, uh, as with all CUPs, this uh, goes under consideration with the seven standards of ACUP. Um, I'll get into the details as far as what this specific site means um, and the building um, when we get into the uh, uh, action item on the site. Okay, thank you. And now, with public hearing, we're looking to hear from anyone who would wish to speak on this item. Is there anyone wishing to speak? I'd like to, my name is, <clears throat> sorry, Amy Alexander. I'm a resident at 1731 Deckner Avenue. And um, although I really appreciate the need for this building, I'm just wondering with, uh, I looked at the increase in crime rates and a few other things um, where the site is now on Webster. And with, you know, uh, public school being there and a lot of um, kind of an increase in our crime rate in that area already. I was wondering if that is something that had been considered. Did you have any more concerns? This is the public hearing portion, so we can't answer any questions. So you can voice any comments or concerns and we'll answer them later. Um, I think that was about, uh, that. that's all. Just wanted to, that was my concern is crime rate because I, you know, at some point, um, you know, I just live three doors down and it's pretty uh, not that quiet of a neighborhood to begin with. Um, and so just want to voice my concern about an um, increase in crime rates um, as a result of that. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Hi, I'm Paula Jolly from Mandolin Foundation. And um, I couldn't really understand what she was saying about the crime. It was kind of muffled. Um, I, I'm assuming she was asking about the crime or police calls to our building. Um, um, that is correct. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, we have, uh, we've had a couple police calls, but it was someone was having um, a 911 type of situation and um, trying to think of what else it was. It was nothing like out of the ordinary. And um, unfortunately where we are right now is a lot of rentals and uh, the neighborhood has kind of a bad reputation, but um, I just wanted to address that. Um, I am personally there about 50 hours a week. Um, we have volunteers that are there about 100 hours a week. 
I mean, a month, sorry, $100 a month. <laughs> <laughs> and um, as of the noise level, we do have uh, written policies regarding um, being good neighbors, um, which includes, you know, if you see trash, pick it up and don't be noisy and, you know, be respectful and those type of things. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, can I just point out that the uh, point, point of order. This is the public hearing, so you cannot address. I'm sorry. All right. It, is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? And there will be more opportunity to speak on the actionable item as well. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Let the record reflect that no one came forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item number seven, <coughs> consideration with possible action on a request for a conditional use permit at 1809 Deckner Avenue for a community living arrangement serving nine or more persons in an office residential zoning district submitted by Paula Jolly of Mandolin Foundation on behalf of old number five LLC property owner. Thank you, Chair. I'll go ahead and note um, <laughs> back over at the, uh, the Webster facility uh, right now as far as uh, complaints go. There have been no um, complaints as far as um, for a zoning department or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, as far as police calls go, it looks just like since around 2020, there's been eight calls that have been beyond uh, control systems um, at that site. Now, that doesn't mean it <coughs> that individual parcel. I think if we all dip our own homes, you might find complaints on it just based off of where you have to be at, but mm -hmm. it doesn't know that there were eight calls um, to the uh, uh, that parcel. Um, moving on to the specifics as far as this individual uh, site, um, when looking at uh, the standards for development. There are a few things when it comes to CLAs that we need to keep in mind. Um, first off is conditional use. And with the conditional use, whether it was nine folks or eight, because within 2,500 feet, there is another facility that could be a CLA, and that's the old Borderman's Nursing Home. That in the PUD states a CLA is a permitted use. So uh, that's about a block away, about 450 feet. It's a large facility. Uh, uh, has been used, but we have heard uh, calls from folks about uh, trying to reestablish our <coughs> use at that site. Um, additionally, when it comes to CLAs, there has to be access to um, public services. So near a bus line, near public trail, near schools, adequate police services, uh, near parks. Uh, the site is one block away from the nearest bus station or bus stop. The site is two blocks away from the nearest public trail, that'd be the Bear Creek Trail. Uh, the site is within 2,500 feet of the nearest park, the old Treble uh, Park. You do not cross Main Street with that. There are two of the parks within a half mile, but you do cross Main Street to access those parks. Uh, and then there are a number of schools that are nearby. Treble is the closest uh, Sullivan School, uh, which is the nearest uh, off to the, uh, the west. And there are some uh, private schools as well uh, in the uh, uh, nearby neighborhood. Uh, as we look at this, uh, for how this site also fits in um, to the design centers, it does, our, our code notes that is it a existing site or a site that you'd be starting brand new and fresh from. Obviously, this is a reuse of existing site. So how does that fit in with the bulk requirements um, for the uh, criteria of uh, dormitories? That's the standard that we need to apply uh, to uh, see if the facility can actually work and function um, for this type of use. Um, so going to ordinance 44-1581, um, the notes are that all on-site services shall be for residents for the facility, the facility only. Mm -hmm. uh, the maximum number of persons occupying the building shall not exceed four per bedroom with 50 square feet of sleeping area per resident, uh, except for uh, uh, that of more than four individuals, which may be allowed for room if the said individuals are related by blood or family. Um, one bath and restroom facility for every eight individuals residing in the dormitory. The bath and restroom facility shall be located so that no individual has to cross through rooms. Um, one kitchen and dining area for every 10 residents. One laundry 
facility consisting of a minimum of one clothes washer, one dryer, and one wash basin for every 10 residents. Um, at least one common use lounge area, at least 600 square feet in the facility. And if the dormitory or the CLA uh, ceases uh, for a period of more than 12 months, then this UP is uh, no longer uh, applicable. Specifically for this property, what they've shown for their preliminary plans, which has to go through a typical site plan review like anything else with, with staff. Um, the preliminary plans show two full baths. Um, if the final site plans cannot accommodate a third bathroom, the max they could have is 16 people <laughs> inside the facility. Um, uh, the kitchen and dining areas are noted on the second floor. The dining space can accommodate 20 folks. Uh, the kitchen space is large. And so with this in mind, um, there has been talks with the building inspection folks to allow, as long as there's, say, two microwaves and two wash basins and two refrigerators within the area to accommodate 20 folks, that the one shared space can act as two kitchens. Um, so they're in review of seeing what can possibly work with the building code to, uh, to make this work. <coughs> and finally, the current plans to indicate just one washer, dryer, and wash basin, but they have to add another to 20 folks. So as staff, we do recommend approval of the request. Um, we note that a maximum of 20 individual residents within the Western renovated air facility as noted from the preliminary plans. Um, if the final plans cannot meet those bulk requirements, then that capacity has to reduce to meet whatever that threshold is. Um, so it's not, if, if they can't meet that because of funding or just general space, then that individual number has to be lowered down. Um, additionally, if they were to come in the future and want to expand the eastern part of the facility, uh, that would require uh, a, a look at with the Planning Commission uh, to uh, uh, change the CUP. Um, if the CLA uh, arrangement is excluded, operation is dissolved, or if the Manuel Foundation no longer is the uh, folks who are operating this, uh, similar to what we had before, no more CUP. Yeah. Um, at the discretion of the Common Council, the Planning Commission, or the Director of Community and Economic Development, a review may be required by the Planning Commission and Common Council to ensure compliance uh, with this CUP. And if there is a concern, the dormitory, but not limited to police service calls, uh, documented safety concerns, inadequate facilities, or zoning and property maintenance compliance. So they're actually doing what the plan uh, would show. Uh, additionally, uh, conformance with the submitted operating plan that was supplied in your packets. Uh, sex offenders are required to register <coughs> um, under state statute are prohibited from staying within the, the dormitory and finally um, all compliance within uh, all the regulations of the uh, Freedom of the Code. We look at things like parking, the sites, fine for it. It's a community center, so don't always see an issue with that. So we would recommend approval. So there's plenty of parking for however many, I mean, I think you're guessing that there's a reduced amount right. of parking that's The necessary. threshold is low on that, but with that said, it, it looks like they did not supply at this moment an actual parking plan, mm -hmm. but it looks like they could put 30 cars in this pretty easily if they <laughs> wanted to. And- Well, that bad parking lot too. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, so the code <laughs> states that you need to have um, one stall for every five residents and then uh, two stalls for three employees. So that would be eight people right there. And if every individual resident was an adult and they all had a, all car, had a car, they'd still have room. <coughs> They're just trying to live their best Ghostbuster dreams, aren't they? <laughs> I do want to note that this uh, provides some additional housing in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also want to uh, emphasize the importance of the housing for women with their children in recovery. Uh, I'm a part of the recovery community in Green Bay, and I can't tell you how many times women are stuck trying to find a way into a new sober life without support and having children that they need to care for that, that keep them out of the... Uh, this kind of a situation that would be so helpful to them. So I really do support it. Um, I do have one question. Every time you refer to individuals, am I right in assuming that that count 
includes each woman and each one of the children. Correct. It's just. Okay. <coughs> I thought so there were a couple points where I got confused by that in, in the uh, staff report. The, yes. the part where they separate is you have those nine bedrooms. Yes. And if you they have larger bedrooms in the case that a mother may have more than four yeah. children, yeah. yeah. So they <coughs> share the same bedroom based off of family relationships. Thank you, John. Any further questions for staff for discussion? Motion to approve. As recommended, yes. Motion by Commissioner Frederick, second by Commissioner Bremer. Hearing no more discussion, I'll go ahead with a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then that will move forward then to City Council for June 27th. Moving on to item number eight. Which is a public hearing, and this public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the Press Times. The Planning Commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject agenda items. We invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, and if you favor, oppose, or providing information. We'll now open the public hearing on item number eight, public hearing on a request for a conditional use permit at 1600 Dowsman Street for the addition of a second accessory garage exceeding 150 square feet in a low density residential zoning district submitted by Michelle and Patrick Scroble, property owners. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be taking this one tonight. Um, so the <coughs> um, property you can see here on the map the one change that has happened as the scrobles have um, actually got the com black combination has gone through. So these are now one parcel. Um, they were two. Um, the future land use around them is single family residential. And that also corresponds to the current zoning in their neighborhood. They are surrounded by single family residential with the park being across the street. Um, so currently the Scribbles have a one car detached accessory garage. Um, it was built in 1950s. They are requesting to keep it and then build a new garage um, adjacent to it. There's a rough sketch here. And then prior to the meeting, they did provide kind of what um, the garage would look like, a, a rough rendering, if you will. Um, but anyway, what makes this one a little bit interesting is we're gonna kind of look at the reverse where we're actually asking um, for the permission to be for the existing garage that's mm -hmm. present as opposed to the new garage. Um, so the current garage is 336 square feet, and we're doing this um, just kind of to um, help out with our zoning code in the way that we can interpret it best. Um, so they can have their first accessory structure be up to 1,000 square feet, um, but that is pending site conditions on the property. Um, in this particular case, it cannot be that large, but that in that district, that's what the maximum can be. And then the second accessory garage um, would be a maximum of 150 square feet. So you can kind of see why we're just looking at this one as being the second, even though it's the primary, it's such a, a goofy thing. Um, and then the, um, the code article, six residential districts um, division to accessory structure states that the maximum size may be increased upon approval of a CUP provided that lot coverage requirements are satisfied and to ensure that the lot coverage requirements um, were met the applicants did purchase the joining vacant parcel as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, the current garage is in good condition they would like to keep it and use it. Um, as a uh, patio area and as a workshop. Um, the, there are the sev seven standards 
that do need to be met. Um, but I guess I will get into that <laughs> later as part of the recommendation. Okay, thank you. All right, now with this public hearing, we're looking to hear from anyone who would like to speak on this. Is Can we speak on that? Yes. That's our garage. <laughs> or our home. We can certainly speak on it if you'd like to. <laughs> My name's Pat Scroble, and we own the property there. Uh, as you see, there is absolutely no parking. That driveway is only 10 feet wide. You have to park partly on the grass to get your vehicles open. We don't have overly sized vehicles. She drives a 1500 Silverado. I got an expedition. Um, that garage that's been built in the 50s, the sill plates are, it's like it was just built. It's all built out of red cedar and it's in awesome shape. Don't want to get rid of it. It ain't worth bulldozing it. We have the extra space and as we are asking for permission to build a 26 by 26 garage in that area. Um, last year, parking on this street's an issue. We've got three hospitals down the road now. And from two o'clock until five o'clock, it's nothing but traffic <laughs> all the way backed up. Her son was parked out in the road at night and his truck was rear-ended. So if he would have been in there, or if he would have been walking behind it, or if anybody was anywhere near there, somebody would have gotten hurt. And it was just parked there because that's the only parking we have. If I parked on the grass, I got a ticket. She parked on the grass, she gets a ticket. We have no, absolutely nothing there. Uh, the park across the street, they have their events going on. So they park on that side that you're seeing now. They park that all the way down. And then they also park on the other side as well. So um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. Both that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Is there anyone wishing to speak? I can speak. I should introduce myself. I'm your alderman. Um. So hello, Alder Star. Anyway, uh, yeah. This so it's one lot. It's not subdivided. So I think that was one of the things I was looking at to see if that would cause any issue with that. But. Um, you know, it's been like that for many, many years. I think it's, you know, it would be a, a wise use, I feel, you know, unless uh, the commission has other thoughts, but I'd like to hear their thoughts as well. But from what I see when I walk the neighborhood and I look at that property, I, I have no issue with it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Could you pop back up the gallery? People. Is there anyone wishing to speak? I want to say one more thing. I'm sorry. I'll be like that other guy. I'm Pat Strobel. Uh, if you look down the road on other properties, there's another property. There's actually two properties that have a, a secondary garage on theirs as well. And I don't. I forget the address of that one, but he's got two double stall garages. And I know that his house is not even the square. He's got more square footage of in his, in his two garages than he does in his house. The lady that lives down the road on the corner, her garage is a two and a half, two story garage. She's got a loft up there and it's bigger than her. She's got more square footage than her, than her house. We're not asking for a Taj Mahal, we're just asking for a garage to park our vehicles in a spot to pull into. That's all I got to say, yes, sorry. <laughs> Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Let the record reflect that no one came forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item number nine. Consideration with possible action on a request for a conditional use permit at 1600 Delsman Street for the addition of a second accessory garage exceeding 150 square feet in a low density residential zoning district submitted by Michelle and Patrick Sprobel property owners. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so staff, 
believes that allowing the second accessory garage over 150 square feet is acceptable. Um, since the lot can support the request and it does meet the CUP um, approval requirements. Um, furthermore, that these, um, the overall square footage of the accessory buildings that they do have must remain subordinate in area um, to the principal structure. So it just kind of what they were saying about um, neighboring properties is that their accessory uh, square footage cannot be larger than their home. Um, so this means that even though the second accessory garage is larger than 150 square feet, that square footage of the structure of the 336 square feet is deducted from the potential square footage um, of the new garage so that that balance is maintained on the property. Alder Stower and um, adjacent property owners within 200 feet have been notified of the request. Um, there have been no inquiries regarding the request. Um, so it's staff recommendation to approve it subject to site plan approval by our office and compliance with all other regulations in the Green Bay Municipal Code. Okay, thank you. So now I understand why you did it because you're they're building a new big garage and now this one's 336 you said so we're talking about 186 feet over okay so i've got a couple are they going to have to do new curb cuts no or? we're just leaving I, no, sorry for your order <laughs> um are they doing new curb cuts or will they have to is the city concerned at all at some point if the property should be redivided into two single lots instead of the double lot are they concerned about that at all in the future I'm just out of curiosity. So. Then um, if that were to get re-split, you would need to make sure that there is a principal structure on it because an accessory structure is that be, be the principal yeah. on its own. I don't know if there'd be like a time limit to do that or if we'd even allow it. Maybe we would just deny it because there isn't a principal use. Yeah, I'm just thinking way down the road, yeah, the property gets sold, and the divided, the house gets built. Like, yeah, if, if they came back to redivide the property, which they have to do with a certified survey map or other land division instrument, um, they would have to pull a permit at the same time that a house, a principal use is going to appear on the property. Because as uh, Dean had said, the garage <coughs> itself is a principal use as a warehouse. Yeah. Um, so it's only decent as accessory. So they, there would probably be some leeway permits are good for a year. Um, but that's already, the, that lot has already been combined. It's been so combined already. Okay. Yep. So I just curious. Do any type of new division. I know how you like I the nice lines. Really and the... I do. <laughs> <laughs> Look, everything nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> Was that something that staff have them join these? Lots before this request because that the question looking at the report that was my initial concern right. seeing two lots but then as presented I have no um, idea about it. when we started doing the neighborhood notices I don't think that the they had filed for their um, lot combination or their assessors combination it was just that it hadn't transferred into our GIS software yet at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So when it showed up on my end, it was still showing up as two parcels. Now, if we look at it, it's one parcel. I just didn't know if it was a good thing to completely veer away from what was sent out to the neighbors um, and post it that way. Yeah. And I would also like, the applicant mentioned Taj Mahal. I'd like to call it a garage Mahal. Oh, uh, that's a dad joke. Yeah. Motion. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Second. All right. Motion by Mr. Dean. Second. Second. Dad joke. 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 Commissioner Ravinsky. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner, <laughs> second by Commissioner Kramer. <laughs> Is there any further discussion or questions for staff? Uh, hearing none, we'll go ahead with the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then that will move forward then for June 27th at City Council. All right. All right, moving on to item number 10. Yes. Consideration with possible action 
on request from Alder Grant to amend the RI zoning single family home definition of unrelated and family adult limitations to limit define family as X and limit the number of unrelated adults to X. Correct. I believe <laughs> I believe she is interested in looking. What this really is is looking at the definition of family. Right. Um, and so right now uh, we define family as uh, three or more. Or three or fewer unrelated individuals. So um, you have a family of 10 and then two roommates, or a family of 10 and another family of 10 and another family of 10 is three unrelated individuals. Um, so that's kind of this area. Um, families have been defined, you know, through histories and codes, um, but it has had some challenges most recently. Um, Typically, it is related by blood, marriage, adoption, foster, yada, yada, yada. Um, but that is often challenged. And what staff would like to do is if you could refer this to the law staff. Mm -hmm. Yes. We would appreciate it great. I would so move. Second. We got a motion by Commissioner Bremer and a second by Commissioner Braddock to refer to law. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> never heard the law. All right, moving on to item number 11. Consideration with possible action on request from Alder Sawyer to look at zoning along Belt Avenue to coincide with the Belt Avenue plan. Alder Sawyer is here, but I will speak for him. So um, we have adopted the Belt Avenue redevelopment plan years ago. And I know you've seen it, you've heard of it, you've heard people have said that it's going to run as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Had the whole entire discussion. Mm -hmm. Salvage business. Salvage business. Got to be careful. Yes, they heard you. Yes, they heard you. But um, so that plan, as part of its recommendations, were to rezone these five catalyst sites in these five minutes. Catalyst sites. Um, it is sort of the city's unwritten policy that we don't proactively rezone very often. So we just wait for somebody to come forward and request it. So, um, but at this time, there's been enough action up there and interest uh, that I believe Alder Stoyer, correct me, is interested in having that rezone and wants staff to look at that. So um, we're all for that and uh, referred on to planning for community and economic development. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bremer, second by Commissioner Rudinsky to refer to community and economic development. All right. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Now we're going back to number one before I forget election of officers. <laughs> Like so you have you have chairperson, right. vice chairperson, and secretary. Secretary is typically default to the director of oh, okay. and all that. Oh, and he can make any of us. I see. Nice <laughs> treatment. All right. So we need to nominate a chair. I'm starting with that. Yeah. Uh, motion nominates Lisa Hansen for chair. Second. Motion second. Now you have to ask three times, right? I, I Are there any further so. nominations? <laughs> it's probably true. I, I are there any other nominations? Yeah. Three I think times there are. Right. Yep. Are there any other yeah. nominations? I'm not trying to fast track myself. Speak up as well as All right. So then we've got a, a motion by Vice Chair Miller and a second by, well, by Commissioner Daniels. Make, meet you. Can I even reside, preside over this? This feels yeah, I mean, you're you would choose yourself. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you vote on it. You can, I think I do get to vote on it. Don't I get to vote? I can vote for myself. <laughs> I mean, all right. Really, so, if you didn't want to do it, no, right. No, we had a discussion in the hallway on the way up. So, all right. So, we just vote. So, there's a motion and a second. Nobody else has been brought forward three times. Yeah. All those in favor? All right. All right. <laughs> Any opposed? All right. 
So then that's just, that just feels very strange. Yeah. Okay. It's always strange. <laughs> I know, right? All right. So then now we're looking for a vice chair. I would like to, can I nominate the people? Because I can't sure. do other things. You should. I'd like to nominate Mr. Jacob Miller for vice chair. I second that. We've been a good team so far. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other nominations? Guys, we very happy. I won't be. <laughs> Do we have any other nominations? <laughs> Is there going to be a fight? <laughs> Do we have any other nominations? All right, hearing none, we have a. Um, what's that? What do you call it? A motion. A motion by me. That's not usual. Right. Motion by uh, Chair Lisa Hansen <laughs> and a uh, second by Commissioner Bremer to make uh, Jacob Miller vice chair. All those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? All right. And so then that is, that's that. <laughs> do you think they need to do one on secretary? Well, like official. Okay. Yeah. All right. Nominate so we'd like to nominate <laughs> Mr. Sexual <laughs> I, I'd like to. Can you do a position? Uh, I would do the position. Yeah. Yes. Nominate the oh. director of community. Oh, gotcha. Right. Because, right. Because mm -hmm. he can do Right. Uh, and we can do this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can we get a second? Second. All right. So we've got a motion by Commissioner Ravinsky and a second by Commissioner Bremer. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? All right. Hearing them, we'll go ahead with the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. And that is that is item number one. So moving on to uh, informational. Director's report. Evening, everybody. Hello, oh, Secretary. Oh, absolutely. That's right. Let's just work on all the, the different titles. This, this <laughs> uh, just a few updates. Want to uh, give some kudos to staff here, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Loy and uh, and Aaron Rubinsky and our staff. For you guys have been following the floodplain saga uh, throughout the city. Uh, it has been a long, hard road with the, with the folks at FEMA. Um, however, the, the gentleman who used to do this work uh, <laughs> left right before it was the report was due last year. So Aaron and John have, have done a, a better job and actually basically providing all of the information and data that FEMA requests in order to maintain the city's flood insurance level. Uh, and they were successful in doing that this year. So, um, so it seems it is a ridiculously and, and really laborious uh, bureaucratic type of process. It does save the uh, save folks money uh, in the city, particularly those affected with the floodplain and have to buy flood insurance. So that's a, a, a really, a really a big deal. Kudo, kudos to staff for completing that uh, as well as they did this year. Um, we continue, we're basically under uh, kind of negotiating our comprehensive plan update contract with uh, Housel Levine, a firm out of Chicago, uh, was the selected firm. So we're going to bring that contract forward. That'll probably come through, uh, I believe, this body and then also city council. So you'll be able to just kind of see the proposal. Uh, we're excited to get them on board. They're already working with Dave on um, identifying kind of what planning areas we're going to be defining and we're putting that right into the contract. So they're actually kind of already kind of on the job uh, in terms of laying some of the groundwork for that process as it goes forward. So we're excited to get that one moving. Uh, we have essentially for our JBS site redevelopment, we actually have four redevelopment concepts that we are looking at. Uh, staff has been in consultations with our consultants on that, looking to kind of bring, bring a preferred recommendation to what we call the G40, uh, the group of 40 stakeholders that have kind of been originally involved in the process. Uh, probably, I think, later this week, I think on Friday, uh, and then also having a public community meeting on, on Saturday over in uh, uh, Imperial Bride here in the neighborhood uh, within the next week and a half, I believe. Um, so look excited to kind of be bringing those forward. I think we'll also be bringing a formal update through this body as well for so actually looking at the, the concepts that they've done. So pretty, uh, pretty intensive uh, range of factors that we're trying to work into this into this project. And I think uh, our consulting team has done a nice job uh, really working that. It's supposed to be a reminder, it's combining uh, essentially a, a destination park, an urban farm, and kind of a housing laboratory, <laughs> kind of all in about in about 25 acres. Uh, with that, that is also very constrained with wetlands, power lines, uh, not so great access. So it, it was it's a challenging site, uh, but we're really excited to see they've really done a nice job. Come with some very creative 
uh, opportunities to really make this a unique area that we think is really going to be a great opportunity going forward. Uh, just a side note, I know Dave already mentioned short-term rentals. That's He is in full swing on that one. Um, if he ever stays in one again, I'll be, I'll be surprised and shocked after, uh, after all the work he's been putting in on uh, getting all these done. Folks recall that we actually did some updates to our ordinance on that that allow us to actually use some available software that our Convention Visitors Bureau. and So, so we've identified three times the amount of potential uh, rentals <laughs> that are out there that really weren't on the list before. So all those folks... <laughs> Now we're getting a letter saying we're saying if they are actually active, that they need to get their permit. All of those permits are now coming in uh, and, and still in variety, even though we send them the application materials still um, not exactly as thorough as we'd like some of them. So Dave's doing a better job trying to keep his, keep his arms around that process. And then just one more note, uh, to, to essentially tomorrow, uh, there's gonna be a request coming through RDA that will probably get referred to this body uh, to look at uh, some design standards for, the, for our downtown zoning districts. For a variety of projects. So there's been a couple of projects that have, have raised some concerns, but essentially under traditional zoning, we don't really have a whole lot of say at this point, but we think maybe some design standards would help kind of create that and maybe give a little bit more leverage on those projects going forward. So RDA will very likely be making that recommendation and referring that to this body, staff in this body in the very near future. So, so with that, uh, any questions on anything? No, I got one. So based off what you just said there, I was looking at RDA's agenda earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, is the idea there to just try to put what's in the authenticity plan into it? Uh, codify and try to put into action is, is that, that what will be, understand? That's actually going to be a majorly a major driver behind that. But the plan, of course, is from 2014. Uh, so it's a little on the older side uh, in terms of the actual, one of the goals in the implementation recommendations is, was is to update that fairly regularly. Well, that really hasn't been done. So I would say the caveat, I would say yes, but maybe not in its absolute current version. It probably needs some updating, which we're certainly looking at a minimum going to be incorporating that into our comprehensive plan update. But I think we'll also be looking at it a little bit more uh, in the short term future, looking at a couple different improvements we might be able to make short term. So and that leads into my next question then too, with the authenticity plan mm -hmm. being near almost 10 years old, new comprehensive plan coming up there is, I guess more, more of a detailed question probably when we actually get the right firms. Mm -hmm. Just like how much in emphasis is going to give into certain downtown to districts, to neighborhoods of that? Is that going to be <coughs> since we don't, I don't want to go update the authenticity plan? Use that. Yeah, the, definitely what we're kind of looking into is trying to incorporate those by reference as much as we can. Um, we kind of want the plan document to be uh, you know, most comprehensive plans. You know, Dave's actually got this fueled down better than I do, but you know, most comprehensive plan documents are just they're massive, yeah. and you have to get, have to be uh, you have to it takes years just to learn how to navigate the darn things. We really want these to be much more usable. Uh, so the level of detail of actually getting down to what's in those plans is probably not what we're trying to achieve with the overall comprehensive. We want to incorporate those key elements as an overarching plan document. And then certainly make recommendations on making updates to those other more area specific documents and districts as we go through. Uh, they certainly will be doing that as part of that process. Um, but I think so, but it's very likely some of those recommendations might be, yeah, we had a lot more conversation on say the authenticity plan for downtown, then this this is going to need more, this is going to need more review. So we actually have set aside some additional budget. Uh, this weekend, the comp plan is being funded through uh, ARPA funds mm -hmm. is our update. So we actually set aside a, a, a good portion, actually 20% 20, 20 of the budget, I think 20, I think it was, I believe, to for additional, more specific plan updates and other work that might come out of the plan for implementation. So, yeah. but no, it's a great question, Jake. Like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of chicken or the egg. <laughs> In this case, we've got all these individual plan documents and corridor documents and all these other things. That are probably pretty good for the most part, but we do need to go back and review a lot of them. A lot of them have been around for a while, and uh, I know, for example, uh, in the uh, in the authenticity plan, a lot of the Broadway district recommendations. I don't think uh, Alder Johnson and on Broadway are probably quite on board with exactly how they're phrased right now. So I think he probably he's, he'll be the first one to say, "Yep, we're going to update that document. We need to make some changes on that one." So, um, so we just need to sit down and have that review on some of those key corridors and those plan documents. And, and to that, likely what they're going to be in the new plan will be referring to the existing with some recommendations on it, either to adjust mm -hmm. them or not. Or if they're that, like Neil had said, if they're that outdated, they may actually recommend the changes. Mm -hmm. But down to the level, I mean, this is again a 40,000 foot document. 
you're not going to have them picking all locations for planters and French <laughs> styles. But believe me, anybody who calls, it's like, oh, we'll get that in the compound. Like, mm, <laughs> <laughs> we have to have a lot more money. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, and the same thing with the corridors, the more dated ones. We'll try to we'll try to uh, get them to comment professionally, and then either if it's that important, we'll try to do it in tandem. Um, and get a different contract to do it in house, or um, just have it as a major recommendation for when it's adopted. That that would be our next, you know, one of our next action items, whatever they have to be. And we're hoping to get a couple more corridors in. Uh, I mean, obviously, right now we have Belt, uh, University, Military. There's another one too. Which one? Um, oh, yeah. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and the, there's in the shipyard, you could say that's an area plan as the shipyard, but authenticity plan, which I like to call it authentic. I see it wrong too. Yeah, authenticity. 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 That's how I always say it. That's how I always say it. There's a there's an old Main Street plan that's uh, very dated. There's a military avenue, more of a corridor, but it's also got area sections. We talked about that earlier. I think one that may come up that we might be just because of the NFL draft coming up is the oh, connection true. between oh. downtown to Lambeau Field. Okay. So Broadway, so, that we just that's going to be <laughs> there's going to be a lot of transportation things that need to be looked at there. Um, who knows? Maybe yeah. there's there's a, probably a small chance that uh, we kind of I think the mayor was in a meeting with with Amtrak and kind of reminded them that we had the draft coming and they're like, oh, well, oh, oh, kind of seemed to indicate that maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea to kind of try to accelerate that a little bit. So that would be fantastic if they were able to do that. But a uh, lot, lot of work still to be done on those. So. Yeah. The infrastructure's there. It's just the buildings. Yeah. 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 So I guess to answer your question, but they're not even under contract yet. They're already starting to do some of that. Yeah. Um, this yeah. week we're supposed to get fresh professional service agreement to then go through the speedy wheels of government. Yeah, I did have a quick question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure this has a name, but I was just on Google or Earth looking through downtown Green Bay. These parks was behind the Hampton. That's WPS. Yeah. Or it was WPS. Is there so did it still, it is there a plan for because I'm just looking at this and this like a lot of I'm surprised that developer is not looking at that's all, this, that's all raised through here. Right. This still exists. Yeah, this is the part this that is, they all tore up for the environmental. Yeah, this is all like, all of this. Like, is yeah, there, several things. We're certainly, uh, I don't based, know what it's called. It's got to be. Well, right now it's just, it's still, it's just a WPS oh, site. WPS. So yeah, so um, essentially uh, base companies is the developer who has that under option right now. The same people as the railway. Same people as the rail yard. Yep. Right. Uh, so what we're essentially at this point, but they're working through with WPS still on the environmental aspect, as Jake had mentioned. Um, there is some of it that's been cleaned up, essentially kind of voluntarily cleaned up to an earlier DNR standard, which is fine. And they've removed bad soil, hauled it off, put clean soil back in. There are a couple of areas that are essentially an EPA super fun site on the so it's a big, ugly, nasty, as awful as you can get kind of site. Um, so they're essentially going to be, that's been a, a slower process to go through that. Uh, probably from the city standpoint, that's probably the key area. We feel we need probably a new parking ramp, parking structure there affiliated with the, um, uh, essentially affiliated with the convention center. We'd like to see it kind of on that backside. It's actually the one by you guys, DJ. Essentially, we need to, we have a development agreement with Schreiber essentially that says, uh, by I think within a matter of within yeah, 10 years, than that, it's quicker than that, I think, yeah. that we're especially supposed to make, knock down that parking ramp and deed that property over to Shriver. Yeah. Uh, that's above everything. That's above yeah. <laughs> so we know, we know at some point we're going to need additional parking. We didn't restore the grid. <laughs> Watch tomorrow's presentation on implementation <laughs> steps if you would like. We'll be, we'll be talking. There's a, there's a long list of things that we have not yet gotten to yeah. on that list. Yeah. Um, but well, Andy, did, to kind of answer your question as well, our preliminary talks with the consultants have been to grab the WPS and the one majority Pacific site. So oh. Cross each river mm -hmm. from each other. Right. Um, you might think the river is a divider. That is not as navigable, but it is a navigable waterway, but it's right. kayak used for- Wait, kayak used? What are you talking yeah. about? That's and all I got. the thought was <laughs> possibly connecting over to a special study area. Doing yeah. that but the developer does have kind of a, a concept that they've done is essentially a lot of, a lot more uh, office and residential mixed use essentially around kind of a central parking 
structure or structures. Uh, essentially, what we're looking at doing there is kind of, and obviously most of our standalone structures. Uh, if we want to use TIF to help pay for those things, certainly we can count on some of the increment around it. But we also add it as it actually make those some residential uses and office uses as part of the actual structure. So whether that's on top or on the outside, we think there's some opportunity to really just be a little bit more creative and get a little bit more density on the areas we look for. But time frame is going to be, I mean, it's going to, the environmental process is driving the bus essentially at, at this point. So in terms of how long we get things cleaned up there, that super fun site, they're saying it could be like till 28, 29. We're like, ah, that could go a little faster than that. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's kind of working with the work the EPA to try to figure out exactly. I think what, and I think WPS would like to clean up to more of an industrial standard that says basically we cleaned it up to this level, you build on, you don't dig down, you can use the minimum. <laughs> From our standpoint, obviously, the planners are like, well, we'd like to think some residential uses would be really nice in there and some residential density, which actually requires a higher level of cleanup to make it safe for people, obviously, to, to reside there. So, so these are things certainly to work out, work through. So, uh, but uh, certainly we with that developer pretty regularly and having updates with them and kind of trying, to, trying to move that forward uh, collaboratively with EPA. So yeah, thank you. I, you know, I just was looking at all of this open space and like, why is it going on? It's a it is it's a great spot. I mean, yeah. you, right on the point with the two rivers, I, it's a fantastic location. It really, really is. So I'm confident that when we get past the environmental issues, we're going to get some really great development yeah, out there. That's a really big retractor from that with the paper mill, which is now uh, they'll be taking down their buildings probably this summer. Mm -hmm. So they're taking them completely down. Yeah, it's already shut the down. Yep, yeah, down to foundations. Yep, yeah, down. They'll be down to the building foundations oh, wow. right now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, Steve Alder Stoyer has some comment. Well, just a little. <laughs> Director, uh, I was going to ask about the historic intensive survey. Where, where are we at with that? That's the city of Green Bay. That, uh, I saw Mr. Flat was in the office today, so I'm assuming he's still working on it. Although I can, I need to specifically <coughs> on that and, and email it out and share that with the commission. Oh, they have like two four three. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. We, they've been doing a certain number of properties uh, every year, and I know we renewed that contract again for this coming year. So, so absolutely still in process. But I can send you a formal update from Jason. Okay. Okay. Is it fair to say we're going to have a good fair amount of input into? Once we actually have oh, absolutely. I would say absolutely. Uh, certainly not only from a use standpoint, but they're certainly going to need financial assistance on this. So this is going to be probably likely coming through an RDA process as well. Yeah. So there will, there should be multiple points of, of, of uh, opportunity, shall we say, for both you guys and the public and the city council to weigh in on, on what can happen there. Hey, sorry, one row. <laughs> yeah, we are we are that, that particular developer we has essentially he's working on uh, the affordable housing project on university avenue uh, he's also working on um the mason manor project the redevelopment project on it so as soon as those two kind of get really moving forward we're going to try to bring him back and get him focused uh, on that on this particular project Got some financial hurdles to get pie on that one. So last we had talked, he was, there was still not a clear path to get things moving forward from a financing standpoint. So, so we're probably getting to a point where I would say sometime this summer we either need to get to a, a new agreement on how to move forward, or we may have to consider um, hitting the reset button on that, which we really would not like to do because we love the design of the building that they proposed, and it's really, really kind of checks all the boxes that with the grocer, the minority business. So it's just a, it's a great project. Um, but we may need to, we may need to, if you have to get more creative, win the lottery or, or figure out a different way to find the finance the project, I think at this point. So next meeting, July 24th. On short term rentals, when we talked about it the last time, we discussed about what other municipalities bordering us were doing. And that Schwab Donald Village passed that ordinance about the six night minimum. Any concerns or? How that it might impact us or not yeah, us not not really at this time uh, i think we're kind of we're still kind of evaluating the the overall i guess impact of what that could do because uh, when we've talked to a couple of individuals who are kind of looking at this as well as well they'll tell everybody they're charging a six night rental and pay the same amount that they would charge for a three night rental but it'll be they'll be it'll be rented for six nights same invoice will say six days but they won't only able be there for eight. so i mean there's it, it wasn't really achieving what they want to do other than maybe slowing down they couldn't get two three, <laughs> two, three rentals in a row so I, whether or not it was as effective as it could be i think we're, we're this is a good first step in terms of getting the increased registration and permits i think is a good but we're definitely going to have to see 
some additional opportunities to really kind of work. And the Schwabenau has been great. We've, we've, we've been sharing information, and, you know, talking to Aaron Schutte over there, their, their community development director in terms of figuring out how do we, what's the best way to do this? Because we, 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 neither one of us really wants to see one get way more restricted than the other one and cause, a, you know, an influx one way or the other that's really not an interest. But there's so many of them right now, it, just, it wouldn't make a difference under on both sides of the municipal boundary, so. In reality, some of those homes, the closest homes, especially in Schwabenau, Mm -hmm. They could charge them whatever they wanted, and they'd still be there. Yeah, um, really? yeah, the work view is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> we are. We do think one thing. I think that is fairly obvious from all of Dave's work and his that he's put into it is I think there's a definite likely situation that in the budget this fall we'll be looking for a staff person to not only process the applications but also do inspections mm -hmm. and actually get out and, and actually make sure we're enforcing. Our, our current rules that we have or whatever any new ones we may have actually going out and actually having someone specifically targeted to go out and enforce the rules. Other than Dave, he's got enough stuff to do. <laughs> so thank you for them all. Any other questions? I was looking both ways. I asked my two. All right. All right. All right. All right. I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dave. It looks like the date of the next meeting is July 24th, 2023. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Commissioner Minsky, second by Commissioner Craddock. All those in favor? This is really Aye. 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 You're here? I don't know. All right. we'll hey. Good night. We'll cake if you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, this is a little bit of a problem for all your property. Oh, I see. Yeah.